it is my distinct pleasure to be able to moderate a panel with uh, such experience on it and uh, of, of uh, former friends, current friends, new friends. I'm not sure um, how, to, um, how to describe all of that. So I'm looking forward to a really rich conversation. I do want to set the stage early. Um, audience questions are encouraged. Don't wait till the end. If you have a question as we go through the process, as, as we're going through here, please, you know, raise your hand. We'll figure out how we get it incorporated. I will see you. We'll figure out how we get it incorporated into this. It's important, I think, for me and for the panelists here that no one leaves the room with a question that didn't get answered. Um, hopefully, we've navigated a conversation that will do that. Um, but I'm, I'm particularly looking forward to this. Um, we heard on the previous panel, you've heard on and off through the course of the afternoon about how important all of these technologies are, how important information sharing is, what AI is going to do for things, how much data there is and how much needs to remains to be exploited um, in the environment, where the gaps are um, that are there. This panel is really powerful for me because it brings it home for a particular community. Um, when we were uh, talking earlier, one of the uh, one of my uh, colleagues here you know, really made that point, and I thought it was really profound. We're talking about critical infrastructure here, right? The the place where when something goes bad, we feel it as citizens, and we feel it oftentimes very quickly and very profoundly in our daily lives. And so, you know, it's it, I think that's one of the reasons why um, why it has so much attention, rightfully so, um, but certainly why we have to keep the attention on it. What I'd like to do is to ask each of my panelists to really talk about for a moment what their focus is uh, and their priorities are in terms of security and resilience of critical infrastructure. Um, and if they, you know, if you want to introduce yourself more as a part of that, feel free to. And so I think Nick will start here. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Bobby. Um, great to be here with the Homeland Security and Defense Forum. Um, I think that for me, working at the Office of the National Cyber Director at the White House, uh, the critical infrastructure mission is really core to what we do, right? If you look at the national cybersecurity strategy, the first pillar is defend critical infrastructure. That is very much how we orient ourselves. And some of the, the issues that my team is working on in particular, uh, one of them is implementation of the national cybersecurity strategy. We just released um, our second version of the implementation plan. Uh, first time a year ago, uh, just just about uh, on Saturday was uh, the first version. This is something that you're going to keep seeing from the interagency. I mean, one of the things that's also exciting about this panel, in addition to having Matt for some private sector perspective, we also have great representatives from the interagency. Um, and you saw that with Neil and Chris on the net, on the last panel as well, working together. Cyber is a team sport, and the way that the implementation plan is structured is to ensure that we have kind of coherent vision of how we're implementing the president's national cybersecurity strategy. A couple other things that we're particularly interested in ONCD these days, um, lots of attention on cyber insurance, um, something that is a both uh, immature but maturing marketplace, right? And I think that particularly with the advent of ransomware, we've seen a lot of folks who are customers and people who are trying to get policies. Uh, seeing coverage limits as premiums go up, uh, which is not ideal, and we're looking for ways to better mature that market. Um, something else I know we'll talk about later, uh, regulatory harmonization, huge priority for us at the Office of the National Cyber Director and working to ensure as we put requirements out there for critical infrastructure, we're harmonizing them to the greatest extent possible. I could go on and on. Um, we have uh, now 100 initiatives that are highlighted in the implementation plan. I know most of them by number, but not all. So, you know, forgive me if I get one wrong. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that's kind of a quick overview of what the critical infrastructure mission means to ONCD. That's great breadth of focus, right, which is really necessary for the, the environments that we're talking about. Cynthia. Uh, so, hello, everyone. I'm Cynthia Kaiser. I'm a Deputy Assistant Director with FBI Cyber. And when we're thinking about critical infrastructure, what both FBI Cyber Division and across all of our 56 field offices are focusing on is hunting for, understanding, and ultimately trying to stop uh, cyber foreign cyber operations from compromising critical infrastructure. 
uh, really in the past year, the FBI and our partners have identified cyber actors located in China, Iran, and Russia, who have all in some way compromised operational technology networks uh, across U.S. critical infrastructure entities, which you know, could have a damaging effect if successful across all of our communities. And so really countering these operations is why the FBI is committed to assisting victims and making it harder and really more painful for cyber adversaries to succeed, including when possible, stopping these operations entirely. And really for our teams, what that's meant is using intensive data and other analytics to hunt for and find adversaries across systems. We've uh, worked with our federal, private sector, and international partners to identify and notify victims, offer victims assistance, including technical assistance, as necessary and appropriate from our uh, FBI cyber action team, our CAT team, and um, being uh, developing technical operations so we can remove adversaries' access to the infrastructure they use to conduct these operations. And then I think critical to all of that activity is being proactive about sharing the information necessary to counter and protect uh, our networks from cyber adversaries. And that includes getting out there the sophisticated tactics and unsophisticated tactics that our adversaries are using to be successful. Really helpful. I mean, you're, the, the breadth of the threat actors, the breadth of the environment, the need to engage. Um, and I know you've had some really successful operations of late. Aranga. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Iranga Kahangama. I'm the Assistant Secretary for Cyber Infrastructure Risk and Resilience at DHS. And I think where we think about cyber and critical infrastructure is really both at the nexus of policy and operational work. And so when we think about what priorities we're looking at in this space over the next several months, um, there are few, and they span the range of policy and operational type things. In the policy space, I think top of mind is um, incident reporting and uh, uh, building out an implementable uh, cyber incident reporting regime nationally as promulgated uh, through uh, legislation from Congress. And so working through that over the next 12 months will be a key priority for the department. Uh, and then I think likewise, operationally, uh, a lot of what Cynthia mentioned resonates with us, obviously, in helping protect critical infrastructure, particularly as we look at threats uh, from the PRC, sophisticated threats as well Typhoon, and making sure that we are able to promulgate guidance and work with victims uh, to identify and remediate these types of activities. I think second to that and related is that a national conversation, not just about how to prevent these types of incidents, but a conversation about resilience and making sure that critical infrastructure owners and operators are resilient even in the face of uh, potentially inevitable cyber attacks, recognizing you may not stop every single one. So how do you have that resilient nature that allows you as an entity to continue to provide essential services to Americans? And then I think finally related to that, as our role through CISA being a national coordinator of critical infrastructure, how do we raise the bar for all of those sectors uh, that have varying levels of maturity? When we talk about a team sport, you know, that includes all the sectors that we're working on. And so really building the tools and capabilities and knowledge across all the sector risk management agencies so that uh, whether you're a hospital, a water sector, or a financial institution, you have the same level of communication, protection, and knowledge to help defend yourself against some of these cyber attacks. Um, and then I'd be remiss to say if I didn't include election security is obviously uh, <laughs> one of the interim uh, priorities for the department and the government writ large. But thanks for having me here today. Yeah, it's uh, just not, nothing like dropping that at the <laughs> end. I'd be remiss to say. It's intentionally at the end, uh, yeah. there as well. Matt. So uh, did a beat with CISA and DHS, had a great time, loved the mission so much, wanted to go into critical infrastructure, and joined a company that really invests in not just protecting itself, but working with the government to protect others. So my role is to really address the cyber and emerging threats that come out that, are, that really are a challenge for critical infrastructure and into the future, and to build those strategies to where we really are looking to make sure that all of our things are threat informed, so we're not just building a really hardened box, we're building a box that our adversaries are trying to break and how they're trying to break it matters. And so uh, really, really enjoying what I'm doing now. Uh, did enjoy the time in DHS as well, but uh, it, it's, it's a real fun world out there to know everybody's got uh, uh, an IOC for you 
everybody's knocking on your door when you don't want them to, and, and it's really something that's a, a game that doesn't slow down, but at the same time, it really paints where our adversaries are looking at critical infrastructure and how uh, it really is a, a supply chain issue, it is a vulnerability management issue, it is a, a management issue all the way up to the C-suite. Uh, I can assure you that there's no one in critical infrastructure that doesn't know about cyber now. That may not have been the case eight years ago. It is the case now. And so it, it's, it's a luxury now to have that conversation come up and for everyone to be more mature. Yeah. Uh, as you can tell, we've got quite the breadth of experience here. So again, if, if you have a question, please uh, uh, don't wait till the end, hold on to it. I have lots of them. And so if no one has one, we will have a fun conversation anyway. Um, I, I would really like uh, to start with this, um, with the theme about driving the increased security and resilience for critical infrastructure operators. And so Ranga, I really like the fact that you brought the resilience side um, of that into there. Um, for me, having been involved in this for quite some time, what I've loved of, about what's going on now is how integrated it is, right? It's, it really takes the whole of government to whole of nation and makes it real in a way that, that we had hoped for before but had never been able to do. So I think that's really wonderful. And the fact that it's the first pillar in the strategy um, really made a state there. So I'd like to get an update on a couple of things here. Um, Nick, you talked about uh, uh, regulatory harmonization. Setting security standards is an important part of this overall secure and resilient space. You want to give us a little bit of an update about uh, where we are, where you are in that, particularly you know, sort of given the, the environments we're in today, um, there are headwinds and tailwinds in this space, and, and I think both are working for you and against you. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, if you look at the strategy, right, the first pillar is defend critical infrastructure. The first strategic objective in that first pillar is a recognition that we need to set requirements. And that's really driven by the fact that if you look at what we're trying to achieve writ large with the strategy, one of the things we're trying to do is to enhance, encourage investment in long-term cybersecurity and resilience. And the feeling was, uh, I think appropriately, that regulation is an important tool in the toolbox. It's not the only tool, it should not be the default per se, but we should also not handicap ourselves by saying, oh, we're just going to look to what we can do voluntarily. These are matters of national security, um, and we need to ensure that all citizens of the United States are able to benefit from the uh, functions that are performed by critical infrastructure. So we need to ensure that there's a minimum requirement. Um, several folks have already mentioned maturity, right? And that is part of what's driving this. There are sectors that have had cybersecurity, information security, data security, some form of that um, on their information and communications technology for decades. And there are sectors for whom there are not any today, nor have there ever been. Uh, and we really need to do a good job of lifting everyone up, right? Raising all boats in terms of saying there are some uh, table stakes that you need to have with respect to your cybersecurity. That's the thesis here, that's what we're driving at. But there are a couple of nuances that we put into the strategy and that we're trying to carry forward as well. One of those is that we're really interested in effective regulation, right? We are not interested in regulation for regulation's sake. We are interested in regulation that drives investment because that's what we need in cybersecurity and resilience. And the way that we develop effective regulation is to talk to the people who are actually the owners and the operators of critical infrastructure who are operating the information systems we're interested in. And that is critical to our success, right? So that is one piece of how we do this. The other is to say the focus needs to be on incentivizing investment, not on compliance. And this has historically been a big problem because of the way we do sector-specific regulation. In the financial services sector, there are more than a dozen just federal regulators. Mm -hmm. um, and what you'll see in sectors that have more maturity, you see folks who come and say, look, we're spending between of a CISO, a chief information security officer, anywhere from 30 to 50% of their time is being spent on compliance activities. And when those compliance activities, particularly when they're duplicative, when they're dealing with the same systems, the same set of requirements, but you have to prove the same thing multiple times to different regulators, 
that is impeding. That is not driving investment in cybersecurity and resilience. It's driving investment in compliance. And that's something that we feel very strongly we need to get away from. Uh, one of the ways that we've talked about doing so, and uh, you know, we've seen great partners in industry, in the interagency, um, the, there is interest in the regulators in addressing this, but also in Congress. So last month I testified in front of the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee about specifically this topic, and one of the points we raised is in order to design a framework that will allow for reciprocity, which is our true goal here, we need to bring all of the relevant parties to the table, um, including independent regulatory commissions. And I think we've seen just this week some uh, exciting, you know, uh, activity from Chairman Peters and uh, Senator Lankford to continue to advance the ball forward on this front. So, yeah, I think that's kind of, if you look at the full scope of we need to have requirements, but they need to be developed with input from the folks whom we're trying to incentivize, and we need to focus on getting investments in cybersecurity, not in compliance. That's, that's our thesis here. I was going to ask you the how part of that, and you answered it in your answer. So thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for that. It, perhaps um, talking about uh, how we have to engage with uh, the people who are, in, who are going to be impacted by it, maybe this is a good point to transition to Circea, um, because you've just finished engaging with the people who are going to be, uh, uh, going to be impacted by it. Do you want to give us a little bit of an update on that? Not expecting you to have read all of the comments yet um, sure. there, certainly. <laughs> No, I'm uh, happy to talk a little bit about this. Yeah, I will caveat. So, Circea so comments closed a week ago uh, last week, and you know, and that includes a holiday in between. So, obviously, our legal and policy teams have, uh, you know, not not fully fleshed out in the in the first few days um, all of the comments. But obviously, we're very excited and we're very happy to have the public comment period. I think it's worth noting that it's the it's the it's the end of the formal period, but even in the run-up before we promulgated the NPRM, CISA engaged in a wide range of national level conversations to help shape that. And so we look forward to adjudicating and addressing all of those. I think what I can and will say about Circea is a few things. One, um, building off of Nick's point, we are gonna be viewing and administering Circea with an eye towards harmonization as well. We have obviously heard more broadly than the comment period from industry that duplicative reporting requirements are a very high burden and a very confusing world um, in, in cyberspace for companies and Fortune, multinational corporations really. So, you know, to that end, concurrent with, you know, looking at the comments, we are also establishing conversations between the department and all the other agencies that have cyber reporting requirements to identify ways that we can harmonize reporting. There's clauses in Circea that allow for reciprocal um, uh, sharing of information such that you can sign an agreement and a report to one will count as a report to another and vice versa through CISA. So we want to make sure that we're maximizing the ability to do that. Now that's, that's quite complicated because each agency has different requirements and mm -hmm. so you need to make sure that you know, they're substantially similar enough and that those are fleshed out. But those are, you know, really, really wonky but interesting conversations that my office is actively having right now as we develop CIRCEA. So uh, we're hoping to, to um, provide some harmonization um, in the implementation of CIRCEA as it relates to, you know, other uh, industries that may also have to report to other federal agencies. The other two things I'll say about CIRCEA is that I think it's important that people realize it's not just uh, kind of like paper policy exercise that we're going through. There's the policy part of it, which, you know, we're adjudicating comments and, and determining what the thresholds and triggers are going to be specifically. You know, there are legal uh, amp requirements uh, based off of that. But this is also ultimately like a government IT project at the end of the day. And I think that's really important and something that people miss. Um, and so we're obviously very cognizant of the IT infrastructure, the security needs, the, the user uh, experience aspect of this as well, and building it out in a way that is technically proficient, that is um, interoperable with existing systems, you know, making sure people like FBI can get really rapid sharing of these reports is really important to us. And so building the technical infrastructure is something we're very much in the weeds of as well. And, you know, that gets tricky for, I'm sure, those in the room that are trying to build IT infrastructure with, you know, IT requirements that are contingent on thousands of public comments. And so you have both of these, this IT project and the policy world kind of moving concurrently at the same time. And so I think it's underappreciated how difficult that can be to kind of pinpoint where the requirements go. 
and then the final thing I'll just say is that you know the, the, the policy goals are not simply just to aggregate data. It's not simply to do a land grab of getting the most amount of information possible. It's to get the right amount of information in the right format that can be best utilized to maximize prevention, security, and resilience in this space. And so we take the decisions that we make are through those lenses. And so those require trade-offs in different spaces to make sure that we're maximizing use of it. Um, and that may be different based on the specific use cases in the law and kind of the information environment that we're in. But I do you know, want to emphasize that a lot of the decisions we will make will obviously be in response to the public comments, but it's not simply about gating data. It's about gaining the right kind of data in the right context. So we look forward to continuing to work with folks on that and, and putting out some more information in due course. Yeah. I, certainly, Cynthia, if there's anything um, with the partnership for the FBI there, I think that's really, uh, really powerful um, there. Um, you know, certainly, I think, um, as Aranga noted, uh, we're actually really involved in talking with CISA, and, you know, we actually have a team that sits over at CISA, and being engaged on not only, like, thinking through what does this look like when FBI is working with a victim, ensuring that, like, we're helping them be compliant with CERCIA, but that data and operability piece, and ensuring that we're all operating from the same amount of information, that we're sharing information quickly, but we're also sharing the right kind of information in the right way, and um, it's a... Uh, it's one of these that are the concept is you know, absolutely the, the right move. Um, and it's great for us all to say this. And then in the details, it's really hard really work, hard. right? You know, and, and we have a lot of smart people doing that really hard, really detailed work. But um, the IT aspect of that, I think, sometimes is not as well talked about and really critical to the success of um, you know, CERCIA as it's implemented forward. I think the more friction we put in the system, the less valuable the system is. Um, and so finding that right balance, I think, is is important. It's interesting. I, I note the focus uh, on resilience in your earlier comments, but not, uh, Aranga, on the on sort of the value proposition for Circia reporting. And so... Um, well, no, that's not... Uh, that's definitely part of it. Um, okay. we I figured absolutely as much. Just needed to... No, yeah, thanks for the, the platform and the nudge. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I think what I will say is that the other broad policy, you know, doctrine that we have with Circea is that it's not about just what comes in, but what comes back out the other end, right? The whole point of this is that in an ideal world, we'll have authoritative data on incidents, on um, national level data around uh, where intrusions are happening, what they're what they're being targeted, and being able for CISA and DHS to put out trend analysis, industry-specific, sector-specific reports, and be that authoritative data source so that uh, everyone from, you know, uh, uh, law enforcement to the intel community to, you know, sanctions targeters at Treasury can all have this information to understand how we do that. And that includes resilience because I think as you build in that data and that visibility across sectors, if we can go to the agriculture sector and say, hey, did you know that like 90% of your attacks are going through these three vulnerabilities? Right. These are the efforts you need to make that will make you quite resilient or that, you know, this is the specific type of things that, you know, the adversary is going after. That's with the goal of making the, the, the entities more secure and more resilient. So definitely tied closely with Circea. So it's I'm so excited for us to be customers of all that, by yeah. the way. <laughs> I think that's going to be really great. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think I see that. And um, we have a, a question here, we'll pivot uh, there. Thank you. Um, Frank Sandell uh, from Microsoft, um, but this is more from a, a general public citizen perspective. As you develop these policies and you provide uh, critical uh, infrastructure with these concepts about where the vulnerabilities are coming at, we develop policies of like maintaining like this basic cybersecurity across your, your, your organization. Do we need to establish disincentives as well? I mean, we have HIPAA, we have SEC, you know, coming out now, but so, hey, it's been two years, you haven't solved these problems, now you've been attacked. We have this major incident within agriculture, just pick an industry to say, well, no, you, you, you were aware with, you know, DHS made you aware of this. You know, we had the policy that you had to maintain this, and because you don't do these things that we have to now establish disincentives, like HIPAA fines and what have you. Are these conversations also happening within, you know, your, your areas that we need to, you know, there, there must be a hammer somewhere as well. Yeah, again, I think that the perspective that we have in the administration is it's all of the above. So let me give you an example. We're talking right now about 
uh, in healthcare, right? Saying HIPAA is focused specifically on data security and focused on health records, electronic or otherwise. And there are conversations now about can we expand that to broader healthcare systems? Because we know that, you know, for instance, ransomware actors right now are continuously targeting the healthcare sector. Um, tied into that, though, if you look at the fiscal year 25 president's budget request, there is a significant $1.2 billion investment uh, for small, rural, and critical access care hospitals. And that's kind of like you need some of both. You need regulatory requirements that come with them some sort of consequence for not meeting the standard. We also need to recognize that depending on which sector you're in and the varying levels of maturity, like we can't just drop a bunch of requirements on a critical access hospital and say, we're going to fine you for not doing this. It's like they are, then we're doing the adversary's job for them, right? Like we shut down this critical access care hospital because they didn't have good enough cybersecurity so that the adversary couldn't shut them down is like completely antithetical to where we want to live. So you need the full spectrum of tools in the toolbox, and that does include disincentives as well. It's a it's a good question. It's a complex problem that we yes. have. We have a, a question over here. The thing well, what they wanted to touch on was the quantum, was the quantum computing security act. We know that was passed in 23. Uh, at the component level, I can tell you we have not heard anything about it. And I'm looking across here at the top. Uh, top echelon here, and we always look up at the boom level for guidance coming down. But we know that, uh, so I'm trying to give you guys that a real threat because everybody I've talked to is obvious. Oh, well, when it'll happen, but we know that that threat is out there. What's the current <coughs> status that you guys see where you're at with it, and what are the plans to address it? Later? I mean, I think, yeah, Q-Day is real, and that will be an issue uh, in, in PQC. I think. You know, we, we've uh, been very focused on this. We issued at DHS a roadmap through the secretary, I think back in 2021, which is a roadmap for how do we inventory our critical needs in terms of identifying what the encryption are, what the encryption is, and then following, you know, NIST and NSA guidance around how we think about, you know, identifying and then making it quantum uh, encryption proof. I think it is definitely a priority for us. We've been tracking it um, and uh, we take it as a priority. I also think that, you know, I recently had a roundtable with about a half a dozen quantum startups to talk about the benefits of quantum, because I also think that the quantum aspect is often talked about as a doomsday, and, you know, in certain scenarios, it, it may be for, 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 for encrypted security reasons. But there's also a big boon in the technologies when you look at things like sensing technologies. Even, though, even in the DHS mission space, that provides a lot of opportunity, whether that's you know, detecting tremors to identify you know, natural disasters for FEMA to be more proactive, or you know, you know, digging for underground tunnels at the border. I think those are all fascinating ways forward. So we definitely look at it from you know, the preventative side of, of getting ahead of Q-Day, but also on the potential opportunity side, at least for DHS. Yeah, I'll just jump in really quick. From critical infrastructure side, you have the challenge of encryption is a layer of defense. Mm -hmm. So if, if an adversary bypasses a layer of defense and meets encryption, traditionally that's a warm blanket of, okay, they can't do anything with what they have. Ransomware operators are collecting enc encrypted data now to unlock later. And as we all know, everything on the Internet is forever. And so there is a need to get ahead of this in that decade range so that you do have encryption standards in place that still offer that shield and layer of defense as opposed to, you know, oh, well, we, we have to have this in place now so that the, this operation can't crack our encryption in the future. It's, it's really a necessity to move on. So uh, Q-Day is real, bottom line, and, and there is a tension um, on it. I want to make, in, our, in sort of our last five minutes, I want to pivot a little bit um, here. We've talked a little bit about information sharing, but I don't think we've gone into it, and this sort of collaborative defense concept, which is vital for critical infrastructure. Um, 
the public-private sector collaboration is great. The interagency collaboration, I think, is really great. And as the scope and scale of everything is changing, I think we, we, we need this more and more. Cynthia, would you like to talk a little bit? I'd love to hear about some of the lessons you've learned with, in your experience from the FBI. You touched a little bit on information sharing and sort of what works and what doesn't. Could you dig into that a little bit? Uh, certainly. So I think, you know, when it comes to information sharing, the FBI is really focused on assisting victims and preventing others from becoming victims. But, um, you know, I, I think it's really easy to get uh, stuck in a mindset of all warnings have to be new or complex. And, you know, but really the majority of intrusions that are going on across the U.S. are because of fixable problems that certain people just weren't tracking. And, you know, that's really why um, the FBI is um, committed to set providing and proactively sharing as much information as we can, as publicly as we can, to include indicators of compromise or known tactics that adversaries are using so that we can help aid network defenders in protecting their own systems and keeping their businesses open. I think a really great example of that is uh, an alert that FBI, CISA, and our partners uh, published a, a few months back that talked about pro-Russian hacktivists targeting of operational technology networks across North America and Europe. The mitigations we put in there included you know, updating passwords from default passwords on, def on, on your devices and uh, implementing multi-factor authentication, limiting OT networks from the internet. These aren't new, right? And then they're not necessarily all that like sophisticated, but they're really important to still put out there, especially when we see adversaries using them to be successful, to even if it's nuisance level on operational technology. And so I think for the information sharing purposes, that's you know one of my biggest lessons of the last you know years that we've you know been doing this, that we've been increasing. Nowadays, I think you're going to see so many more industry alerts on FBI's uh, Internet Crime Complaint Center, IC3.gov. I think there was you know over 40 industry alerts last year, up to over 30 this year, and really that's focused on the novel, the new, and the used. And I think mixing both of those to really try to protect networks is part of being the best partner we can be. And I think that's also why it's really important and we continue to emphasize know and call your FBI field office before and you know an intrusion occurs, get to know people, know what we can offer uh, in the middle of a crisis if you need it, but then also know how to just get useful information into your hands so you can really be in the best protection you can for your networks. Yeah, I think that's good. So in our last few minutes, I want to lightning round this, and I'm going to start with you, Matt, and we're going to work back this way. Two, two questions. Um, what's your prediction for 2025, and what's the one thing you want the audience to take away? So for AI for 2025, we're going to see a strength in the defender operations because the big challenge we have right now is the turnkey from a malware operator getting access to your system went from years, weeks, days, hours, minutes, almost instantly. So if you have a vulnerability that that door is open, they went from having a strategy of how to deploy to acknowledging the deployment hit almost instantaneously. So having those defenses work at that pace, at that speed, that candidly humans can't hold is going to be the strength that we're going to see in 2025 because the bad guys are using similar tools, but their, their defense tools aren't candidly as mature as some of our offensive stuff. So we have the ability now to get a defender's advantage, and I, I think that may not last long, but it'll be 2025, so we better take advantage of it. Uh, what I would have the audience take away is especially from critical infrastructure and industry side, working with government has been an, an increase and, and, a, and it has been advantageous, but there is an expectation that none of these attempts that the government or industry figures out bad guys are doing is going to work twice without a mitigation in hand. So yes, there are going to be those that don't patch. There are going to be those that have challenges with nation state adversaries advancing very expensive things. Uh, but we're, 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 we're in it together as a community to say, okay, if something happens in any part of the world and any of us know about it, we can't let that happen twice, at least without being very noisy about it. And there's been a great increase in government, so I, I applaud all your efforts. You've been doing very well. And, and I will also say industry has been leaning in, even pre circia into sharing that information to make sure that that outcome, that goal, hits on those marks. And so that's, that's where we really have to see it 
and, and the prioritization of, by the way, we told you that this mitigation was bad and it's accelerating. You have a wildfire moment. Get after it is also very helpful. Saranga. Um, so I think staying on theme for 2025, I, you know, I predict a, a, our ability to promulgate a final rule on Circea and really get that <laughs> pass myself to <laughs> abiding by the timelines in law. Um, so I predict that and I'm optimistic that that will be a boon to everyone on the stage and everyone in the room and our ability to implement it will really be a helpful resource for everyone. So that's kind of what I'm looking forward to the most in 2025. Um, in terms of AI, I think I agree with Matt. I think I've really already seen some really interesting tools, not just on the defense side, but I, I guess I'm really optimistic that it will raise the tide of, of, of sophistication and um, of defenders, like particularly just like very mundane things like SOC analysts and, mm -hmm. and people sitting in SOCs being able to manage and have support to identify and triage the highest order tickets and really streamline a lot of the really mundane tasks and allowing them to have more space to do things that I think are more important. I think that could have a multiplier effect. And I think that's going to be something if we can focus on will bring in a lot of new entrants into the space, right? And, yeah. and it can really set a higher bar for how we make, you know, diverse and non-traditional people also enter this community and kind of grow the deficit of cyber uh, expertise that we have in the country, both private and government side. I like that. All right, Cynthia, prediction for 2025 and one thing you want the audience to walk away with. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna stay on the AI theme just so I can echo it, that I do think right now that the cybersecurity benefits of AI far outweigh the, the risks that we have, but I do, uh, the FBI is not taking that for granted, and we're really um, keeping a laser focus on what adversaries are doing. In fact, just yesterday, uh, the Department of Justice, FBI, and some of our partners, uh, we put out information about a Russian disinformation uh, influence kind of tool that really is the first time that we've talked about uh, outing and um, disrupting something using incorporating Gen AI concepts into some of its tooling. And so our adversaries are going to be using AI to be labor, like save their labor, uh, you know, do basic coding, et cetera. They are going to use it to lie better, uh, whether that's spear phishing emails or some tools like this. And, you know, they're going to use it to try to hide where they're at in the systems. And I think that's why, and that's, I'm gonna, um, what I want everyone to take away home, that's why it's really important for us all to work together. It's why it's important to reach out to your uh, FBI field office, get to know them, but it's important to know all of us. And it's important to really have that partnership because that's the only way we're going to be able to keep that balance weighted towards, I think, that cybersecurity benefit. Bring us home. Great, um, I'm not gonna talk about AI. So uh, <laughs> my prediction for 2025 um, as a policymaker, is 2025 is going to be the year where I think conversations about software liability really start to hit more of you know a, a broader community. Um, it was in the strategy. We've been doing some work on it at ONCD, but I think if you look at what the new European Commission that's being formed and where do I think some of their heads are going to be at, going to be a lot of international conversations about you know, software liability is a next step after the Cyber Resilience Act. I think it is incumbent on us as United States policymakers and software manufacturers to have a lot of really, you know, in-depth conversations about this topic, which is one that is kind of floated around in the academic ether for three plus decades, um, but get down to brass tacks to get left of that because I think we're gonna hear a lot more, especially from the EU about this topic in 2025. Um, and again, I wanna get as far left of that as possible. In terms of takeaways, the, the word that I heard a lot from my partners, from myself, maturity, right? And I think this is like one of the things that is a theme across the board is we're at different places in critical infrastructure, um, depending on which sector you're in. Uh, depending on how long you've been regulated, depending on how mature your sector risk management agency is, we are committed to raising that across the board. Um, you see that in the fiscal year 25 budget, which is gangbuster for sector risk management agencies, like investments like we've never seen before across the board. And I think that will continue to be a theme from the administration as we all need to work together to lift all of the different aspects of critical infrastructure together.
Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I think not only are different sectors mature, I think within a sector, you've got a wide range of maturity, even in the most mature sectors. And so uh, for me, the, the big lesson has been critical, we treat critical infrastructure, we talk about critical infrastructure as though it's one monolith, and it is, there's one of everything out there. Um, <laughs> and, and so we really need strategies that address one of everything. Um, so I, I want to please help me thank this panel. Um, they made my job as moderator easy, um, and I appreciate, I appreciate your time. <laughs>